I know most of you, but uh, just to introduce myself, my name is Gary Alton. I'm the managing partner with the Partners Group. And really what we're going to be here to talk about today is pharmacy strategies. And I want to introduce uh, Robert Lewis. Uh, he is with RX Benefits. He is going to be going over, giving a little bit of background on the landscape around uh, pharmacy, what's going on, some of the trends, and then also share with you some different strategies. Um, so when we look at the agenda, I am going to give just, for some people might not know who we are, so I'm going to give a little bit of an introduction about the partners group go over a company by the name of C2 Solutions as well, because even if you know who the partners group is, you may not know who C2 is, so I want to give you that uh, background. And then introduce a little bit about how uh, RX Benefits and the partners group came together, and then the process that we went through uh, to find the, the pharmacy benefit managers that we have on, uh, on tap today. And then we are going to talk about the pharmacy landscape, that's where I'll turn it over uh, to Robert, uh, the pharmacy strategies. I will warn you up front that there's a lot of information on some of the slides. I've asked Robert not to go into too much detail on some of the slides just due to time. Uh, but if you have questions throughout the presentation, don't hesitate to raise your hand. Feel free to ask. I'll, I can tell you pharmacy is very complicated sometimes. There's a lot of moving parts, so no question is a dumb question. And um, it's probably going to be something that if you're thinking about it, other people are thinking about it as well. Uh, I will then wrap up. I want to show you a case study. Uh, for an actual client that we put in a pharmacy benefit management program into and show you after you're the results that we found. So I want to share that case study with you, the experience of the client, and then we'll wrap up and answer any additional questions and like I said, have you out of here by 9 o'clock at the latest. So that's the game plan. So uh, just a little bit about uh, the partners group. Uh, we do operate under four different divisions. So obviously uh, I'm here and the team is here representing employee benefits, uh, but we also have a business consulting division and that's actually, we do a lot of cross work with our business consulting. From a benefits perspective, this is where we're doing a lot of the data analytics. Uh, they're actually the individuals that capture the pharmacy data and work with RX benefits to scrub and perform the audit. Uh, they also do a lot of predictive modeling on self-funded plans for us as well. So they're a great resource uh, that complements the employee benefits. Uh, we also have a large commercial division, and then we have retirement investment services. So those are the four key divisions at the partners group. And then just a little bit more on the employee benefits. Uh, we do serve over 500 clients throughout the Pacific Northwest, just to give you a little bit of <coughs> the scope. And really, uh, we are a full-spectrum consulting firm. So from health and wellness programs, down to negotiations, compliance, healthcare reform. I know, luckily, we're not talking about healthcare reform today. Ellie, we get to talk about that in another couple of weeks. But um, again, uh, anything that is involved in the overall benefits of the plans, medical, dental, life, disability, uh, we do have the full cons uh, consulting package for that. And then a little bit about C2. How many people have heard of C2? Um, so we got a, we got a couple out there. Um, one of the things that we found, the partners group, we have over 120 employees in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, we have six different locations, and when you look at us from a regional Pacific Northwest perspective, we're the largest independent consulting firm in the Pacific Northwest. But when you start looking at the nation, uh, we realize that while we're big in the Pacific Northwest, there's other things going on in the nation that we need to be aware of. And so one of the things we formed about three years ago was C2. And that is the partners group and six other independent consulting firms. We basically combined and funded, it's an equity owned partnership, and we have all contributed to and formed C2 Solutions. And C2 Solutions, uh, over 30 locations, and when you look at it, there was really four goals to forming C2. Uh, one, uh, market leverage. Uh, so again, can we bring solutions to our employer groups in the Pacific Northwest? Uh, that maybe it's something that we couldn't do on our own, but because we have this volume, uh, we can bring and deliver better solutions to our clients. Uh, customer protection and value. So anything that is innovative, forward thinking. What we're working on right now, just to give you a little sneak peek for later in this year, is we are coming out with our own private exchange. And that is going to be something that is going to be extremely robust a lot of decision support tools. And so that's just an example of one of the other programs that we're working on that we're bringing to the table through C2. But again, the partners group maintaining their independence is gonna be able to deliver that to the clients. Uh, knowledge transfer is another thing. 
Um, when we look at healthcare reform, there's so many moving parts. That's just one example. We actually have a director of compliance. Uh, he meets on a quarterly basis with the entire C2 team, all the other agencies that are out there talking about healthcare reform. They go back to Washington, D.C. once a year for an annual meeting as well, just to make sure they're up to speed on healthcare reform. So it's more than just products or programs. And then the last one, though, is a big one pricing advantages. Uh, when we combine our books together, uh, the partners group, along with those six other firms, we are the fifth largest independent consulting firm in the nation with over $3.3 billion of premium under management. So what that allows us to do when we go out and negotiate national contracts is to have some significant leverage. And those are things that we're doing with the pharmacy benefit management program that we're going to talk about today. We're also doing that with stop loss programs. We're also doing that with life and disability programs. The exchange is another example of a program that we're coming out that we're delivering uh, more than we could do on our own because we have that backing of C2 as well. So a little bit of background there. And then one of the first things that we did when we formed C2 uh, three years ago is we went out and looked for a partner that had a high level of expertise in the pharmacy uh, environment. And if, you know, many of you, most of you are self-funded already. I know several of you are considering going self-funded. But when you think about the complexity of a health plan, if you get into the details and you lift the hood on the pharmacy program, there's even more details. It's amazing all the little strands that you can pull on a pharmacy contract or how they price, how they work through the program. And it's amazing of all the different levers that can be pulled and all the different games that pharmacy benefit managers can play. And so one of the things that we did is we needed to get an expert. So we uh, went out and did an RFP, and that's how we found Rx Benefits. So we went out to the marketplace, looked at, okay, who are the experts in the pharmacy field? Let's interview them. And then we decided on partnering with Rx Benefits, and that's where Robert comes into play. And then Robert and C2 went out, and his firm went out and did a extremely thorough and exhaustive RFP. And so this is something where we went out to 13 PBMs, so that's the acronym for Pharmacy Benefit Manager. Eight of them responded. And so you have the list there. It's interesting, though, you know, we put this slide deck together, uh, you know, two or three weeks ago. I don't know if you guys have heard, but Catamaran uh, was actually just bought by United Healthcare. So there is some consolidation going in, uh, in the marketplace. And OptumRx is also owned by United Healthcare. So there's some interesting plays out there going on in the marketplace. But the key thing that I wanted to mention to you here is the, the RFP process, there was over 350 questions, both qualitative and quantitative, that Robert and C2 went through for the evaluation. So, you know, cost management, how great a discounts are we getting off of average wholesale price or AWP? <laughs> that was critical. But also we didn't want to lose sight, okay, it's a great deal from a cost standpoint, but how's the implementation, how's the ongoing service? We needed to make sure there was a balance of both of those. So they went through an exhaustive RFP process. We actually brought in three finalists to Chicago. They presented, and then out of those, we made a final decision to move with Express Scripts and CVS Caremark. So those are the two C2 slash TPG preferred or proprietary PBMs. Doesn't mean that we can't work with other pharmacy benefit managers, but when we do the analysis, and we're going to talk about a case study at the end, what we're finding is from a saving standpoint as well as a service standpoint, because some of the things that they're treating, uh, even a uh, 150 or 200 life account like a national account, there's some definite advantages out there. So uh, that is the partnership uh, with uh, RX Benefits, and that's how Robert uh, came to be here today. And when you look at the value proposition, so I'll wrap up and turn it over to Robert. Uh, when you think about pharmacy, uh, 20 to 25 percent of your spend, of your medical spend, total health plan, is on pharmacy related expenses. So it's a huge piece to the puzzle and it is very complicated. Having someone dedicated and focused on the pharmacy is critical. Uh, we talked about the due diligence of the RFP, so that was an exhaustive process. The other thing that's important to note is that the contract that was negotiated two and a half years ago, that's something that RX Benefits and C2 goes back and renegotiates each year. So they just wrapped up in December the renegotiations for the 2015 plan year where they actually secured some greater discounts on the plan as well. So it is annual negotiations. Uh, aggregate pricing terms with full transparency. You know, that is one of the most frustrating things out there 
when you're looking at your plan, what is it really costing us? Are we getting to the bottom line? And that is what uh, RX Benefits through our Express Scripts and CVS contract can deliver as a full transparent uh, agreement. It is a pre-negotiated master pharmacy agreement, but that contract is held individually by each client. So that contract is fully auditable. We've already talked about the national service account, so regardless of size, we are in the national accounts. And then it is something that it's not just do we secure the contract and get great discounts and then say, good, that's great, we're done. It's actually something that each quarter we go back and monitor to say, your contract said this as far as the discounts. Was, did we actually get those discounts? And so we're going back each quarter and confirming the contractual rates. And we're going to talk in the case study, we actually have the year-end wrap-up. So we said, let's put it in 1-1-2014. We looked at it quarterly, but then doing a year-end wrap-up, we said we were going to get this kind of discount. Did we get that discount? And that's what, again, the, the continual proving on a quarterly and annual basis uh, we look at. And then the last thing, and we're going to talk just briefly about it, and this is going to be Robert's going to talk a little bit about some of the strategies around, okay, we've lowered your cost basis, so we got a greater discounts, but Pharmacy Trend is still doing this. So what other programs can we put in place? What other things can we do to help mitigate costs in the future? So that's something that Robert's going to talk a little bit about as well. But that is really the value proposition when you think about uh, the partners group, C2, and a pharmacy contract bringing it all together, having a very focused effort on 20 to 25 percent of your total medical spend. And so with that, Robert, I'm going to turn it over okay. to you. My name is Robert Lewis. I'm with RX Benefits. We're a pharmacy consulting firm based out of Birmingham, Alabama. So you may be picking up on a southern accent, that's why. Uh, but as Gary said, we were selected to uh, manage and oversee the, the pharmacy partnership for the, uh, for the partners group and the C2 organization. And, Today I'm going to talk to you about uh, the, the pharmacy landscape, some of the emerging trends that we're seeing in the marketplace and, and uh, ways to, to kind of stay ahead of those trends. And then, uh, as Gary mentioned, we'll get into a case study uh, and show you an example of an analysis that we perform uh, for, for the C2 clients on an ongoing basis. Uh, so looking at trends, <clears throat> you know, pharmacy is really the most complex and, and fastest growing components of, of medical spend. Uh, it currently represents 20 to 25 percent of your overall spend. Um, and in the past few years, we've enjoyed really modest trend increases in pharmacy. Uh, but however, as you can see on this graph, in 2014, we saw a big spike. And we're going to continue to see that uh, for the next few years uh, due to emerging trends in the marketplace. Uh, most noticeably in the specialty category. We had 86 new products launched last year uh, and another 50 are expected in 2015. Um, also generics, generics have peaked. Um, there's not really any more room to take advantage of the generics. We've seen this conversion of brands to generics over the uh, past few years that have helped us uh, to, to mitigate trend, but uh, that pipeline is, is quickly dwindling. Uh, and then you've also got the, the cost of both generics and brands that are increasing over time. Uh, in addition to this, studies show that consumers are filling more scripts as the economy's improved. Uh, we're seeing more and more people are di being diagnosed with chronic and complex diseases. So again, costs are going up. <clears throat> when you start to uh, break down the three major categories of, of drugs, it's really interesting because you see on the slide that uh, the, the current allocation of scripts uh, is, is on the left-hand side. You've got 84% of your generics are filled. Uh, it, it, that's your generic dispense rate on average, uh, whereas brands are at 14 and a half, specialty is 1.5%. But if you start to look at the cost profile on, on the right-hand side, uh, you see that each one represents about a third of the cost. So the cost of 1.5% of your scripts uh, is almost equal now to the cost of 84% per percent of your scripts in the generic category. Uh, and it's constantly evolving as the landscape changes and you're going to continue to see that specialty bucket uh, on the rise year over year. Um, so we'll start to dig a little deeper and look at generics first. <clears throat> um, as I mentioned earlier, generics have kind of been our savior in offsetting inflation over the past few years. 
Uh, and again, we've almost exhausted that opportunity. Um, also, we're, we're seeing manufacturers who are pulling out of the generic space, so you've got less competition, uh, and we're seeing shortages in the supply of active ingredients, uh, and this is all causing some of the cost of generics to actually increase. Uh, but nonetheless, the average price of a generic drug is around 50 bucks, whereas the average cost of a brand drug is about 150 bucks. So they're still delivering substantial savings over the brand name drugs. Um, and, and by the way, you know, I mentioned that the uh, generic dispense rate is 84% on average. Um, we're, we're still shocked at how many companies we see with uh, generic dispense rates in the mid 70s. So, you know, if you, if you see your generic dispense rate, if you look at your, your reporting and see that it's low like that, that's a, that should be a red flag. That's something to take advantage of. Um, this illustration kind of further illustrates this patent cliff, so to speak, that we've seen and uh, the, the dwindling pipeline that we're able to take advantage of. In 2012, we saw $35 billion in brand name drugs come off patent. And uh, this gave way to a huge opportunity to take advantage of generic drugs in order to control cost. But you can see that as the years go by, there are fewer and fewer brand name drugs that are going to be coming off patent. Um, so we really can't continue to, to just count on shifting people from brands to generics in order to control cost. Which brings us to the even bigger issue, which is specialty drugs. So, as most of you probably know, specialty drugs are, are very high cost drugs. They're usually injectable. Uh, they require specially, special handling and administration uh, and are derived from a living source, usually the DNA of, a, of mice. Um, they're much more expensive uh, because they're used to treat a much smaller portion of the population than, for example, your average high blood pressure medication, which treats a large portion of the population. Um, the average cost is roughly $3,000 per month, and uh, as we've seen with, with Sovaldi, the new hepatitis C drug, uh, can cost upwards of $84,000 per, per regimen. Um, just two years ago, specialty drugs represented less than 1% of all scripts, and only about 25% of your total drug spend. However, the projected spending on specialties expected to increase by 63% next year. So here you can see that we're expecting specialty to continue to have about a 17% growth rate year over year. Um, in 2012, it represented 30% of pharmacy spend. And by 2018, it's uh, expected to represent 50% of your total pharmacy spend. Um, now, if you notice in each of these bubbles in the illustration that half of specialty spend is actually represented in the medical plan versus the pharmacy. So for every dollar that you spend on specialty drugs in the pharmacy channel, there's a corresponding dollar spent on medical. Um, so why is this bad? First. You know, a lot of plans, plan sponsors don't realize the significance of uh, the pharmacy claims and, and the medical because they're listed on reports that show higher cost claims such as surgeries and whatnot, so they don't stand out as well. Uh, on the flip side, you know, when you're looking at a pharmacy claims report, uh, these specialty drugs stick out like a sore thumb, so it's very noticeable. Uh, but secondly, and more importantly, pharmacy claims are adjudicated using an 11-digit NDC code. Um, NDC codes, National Drug Code, uh, is package size specific, which is very important. Um, and, and that NDC code represents sort of this crosswalk into the price of the drug. Um, so for example, an, an NDC can represent one syringe with one dose of medication. On the medical side, Medical claims, including pharmacy claims that are filed under medical, are, are billed using J codes. And J codes are not package size specific. Um, so they can represent an entire vial of medicine with multiple doses. So for example, if, uh, if a doctor or provider uh, orders a vial, they're, they're, they're administering a, a medication in an office visit setting, they may order a vial that has five doses. Patient number one comes in, they pull one dose, 
from that vial and treat that first patient. And then they bill using the J code for the entire vial. The second patient comes in and they pull the, the second dose from that vial and they bill that same J code using the entire vial. So essentially the provider has charged five times the amount of the actual dose for that medication. So there, there are different strategies you can employ and, and um, certain drug categories can be excluded from the medical plan and, and only offered through the pharmacy benefit, which is going to be a more, more cost effective channel. Um, so when we get into strategies uh, with formularies, you know, formularies are very specific strategic list of drugs that are developed by the PBMs uh, to provide, provide the safest, most effective medications at the most reasonable cost. Um, so, you know, we look at tiered co-payments. We're all familiar with this and how that works. As a member, you pay uh, a, a higher cost for higher cost drugs or for non-preferred drugs and so on. Um, but one of the more recent strategies that we've seen the PBMs deploy is uh, to have exclusions or exclusive arrangements with certain manufacturers. Uh, one example of this is with brand name drugs in which there are multiple alternatives that are available that, that provide the same therapeutic outcomes. Um, so as we see lower cost drugs becoming available, uh, the brand name drugs have to be able to, to keep up with the market. So what we're seeing is they're issuing coupons to, to the membership uh, that, that may say, you know, your first three fills are, are at no cost, for example, or you have a $5 copay for your, uh, for this expensive medication. That's great for the member, but the plan ends up paying for it. So that we, we, that's been a red flag that the PBMs have identified and they've gone back and looked at, um, where this couponing practice is going on and, and excluded these manufacturers or this, these particular brand name drugs from their formularies. So from a plan sponsor perspective, we've seen a lot of groups that are moving toward high deductible plans. And, you know, this has been good and bad. Uh, the problem that we've seen with, with high deductible plans on the pharmacy side is that they're financial models and not clinical models. So, you know, in the short term, members are identifying these plans as, as more cost conscious, um, but we're, we're seeing studies that are showing that in the long run, these plans are leading to reduced office visits uh, and reduced prescription drugs and an increase in emergency room expenses. So it's really important when you're evaluating plan designs to understand what that, uh, that, that break even point, what, what, what's too much for the member to take on. Um, and then going back to the, um, the idea of, of having exclusive arrangements, um, a great example is Sovaldi. That this is that um, Hep C drug I mentioned earlier, $84,000 for, for a 12-week course. It's the most expensive drug we've seen. Um, however, there are other drugs in the market with different, that are made by different manufacturers uh, that are equally as effective. Um, these all have a 95% cure rate for hepatitis C. Um, so, for example, Express Scripts um, decided to make a deal with the Cura Pack, uh, which is an equivalent drug made by a different manufacturer, uh, to be their preferred brand name drug. And they said that, you know, we'll make you our preferred option, uh, and as a result, we want the drug to cost no more than X amount, and by the way, you can increase the cost of the drug year over year by X percentage. So they ended up excluding Savaldi, and, and this Vakira pack is, is their preferred drug on their formulary. Um, so the makers of Savaldi obviously saw this as a threat, so they went to CVS Caremark and cut a deal with them. So the bottom line here is that you know the PBMs are able to, to Kind of create pressure in, in this marketplace which ultimately is going to drive down cost competition is going to drive down cost uh, and you're going to see that a lot with biosimilars for example uh, which is sort of a generic equivalent uh, to um, to specialty drugs so there's there's some light at the end of the tunnel when it comes to specialty but it's really going to be something you've got to keep an eye on going forward
Um, so, you know, we've got all these different dynamics that are occurring in the marketplace, the, the uh, upward pressure that specialty is putting on the market, the downward pressure that we've seen generics put on the market. Uh, but in addition to that, we've got this big problem of, of medication adherence. Uh, people who are, are not adherent or not compliant with their doctor recommended medication regimen. So when you look at a typical population, a typical group, on average, 50% of the population is chronically ill in some form or fashion. Either they've got um, diabetes or hypertension or they've got some sort of a, a complex condition like multiple sclerosis. Um, these individuals represent 96% of your drug spend and 75% of your overall healthcare spend. The problem is that half of those individuals are not compliant with, with their drug regimen. They're not taking their medications like they're supposed to, but they represent 75% of your drugs or of your medical spend. So the question becomes, how do you leverage the pharmacy benefit and, and the PBM and all their clinical tools and resources to get to these people who are not compliant, to get them to a, a compliant state, which is ultimately gonna impact medical costs. It's gonna keep them out of the hospital. Uh, it's cheaper to treat people with drugs than it is in an ER or an outpatient setting. So, you know, obviously if you, if you improve adherence, your drug costs are going to increase, but we call that good trend. So I'll give you an example here. If you look at the middle column, diabetes, uh, we're all familiar with diabetes and, and the expenses associated with that. Um, for every dollar spent on diabetes medication, you save roughly $7 in, in medical spend um, and, and you know we're seeing the same thing with with uh, high cholesterol high blood pressure and so on uh, so again if we can get people to become more adherent to take their medications like they're supposed to it's going to keep them out of the hospital keep those diabetics from from uh, having ER visits which is going to ultimately impact medical costs we want to we want to look at pharmacy but we also want to look at the big picture and how pharmacy relates to to overall spend So, oops. Um, some of the issues or barriers to, uh, to adherence, cost is number one. Uh, convenience, obviously. Uh, people remembering just to take their medications is, is, a, is an issue. Uh, and side effects. Uh, a lot of these specialty medications, for example, have uh, flu-like symptoms as side effects for the first few weeks of the, the, the treatment. And what happens when people feel bad when they're taking a drug? They stop taking it. Well, that leads to waste because now you've stopped taking the drug. You've got to start over in order for the drug to be effective, uh, which ultimately costs the plan money. Um, so, you know, there are different factors that we can deploy to, to support adherence. Um, one of those is going to be the use of 90-day drugs, either via mail or 90-day uh, retail prescriptions. Um, you know, you're more likely to take your high blood pressure medication if you've got a 90-day supply over that period of time, uh, other than having to fill it every, every month. Um, obviously, lower cost drugs, generics, are going to be more affordable. Um, the PBMs have uh, different programs such as refill reminders for the scripts. Uh, and then, you know, going back to the, the conversation around the, the specialty meds, having counseling uh, for, for the members, making sure they're educated on uh, how, their, how their drug works, uh, set that expectation that there may be some side effects early on, but you've got to kind of stick through that in order for the drug to work. You know, the next thing I want to talk about is the options that, that you have as a, as a self-insured plan sponsor uh, and, and how you want to design your pharmacy plan, uh, whether it's in a carved-in arrangement or carved out. And what I mean by that is... <clears throat> In a, in a carved in environment, the medical carrier or the TPA holds a contract with a PBM and it's bundled with the medical. In a carved out arrangement, you actually uh, pull the pharmacy away from the medical carrier and go into a direct relationship with the PBM. So you hold a contract with that PBM uh, and you have guarantees in that contract 
and those guarantees are fully auditable. So you can hold the PBM accountable to the terms of that contract. And as Gary mentioned earlier, pharmacy contracts are very confusing. They're, they're, they can be very misleading. Um, so, you know, it's helpful to have uh, a, a firm like the Partners Group or like RX Benefits to, to be able to assist you in reviewing these contracts. But if you're carved in with a medical carrier, if, if the carrier holds that pharmacy contract, you're totally in the dark as to what kind of a deal you're getting. You have no idea what, what kind of discounts you're getting. They may provide you the high level overview of the, the discounts off of AWP by uh, drug type and distribution channel. But at the end of the day, that tells you nothing because there's so much fine print, there's so many optics that the PBMs and the carriers use in these contracts that allow the contract to look a lot more attractive on paper than it really performs. When you look at who is actually carving out today, um, the majority of, of the, the large employers and the most sophisticated buyers are carving out. 85% of the Fortune 500 are carving out the pharmacy. 94% of the Fortune 100 are carving out. Um, the reason they're doing this is because they see the value. Um, they, they've got, these are massive companies. They've got the, the size and scope to leverage uh, to negotiate very aggressive discounts with the PBMs and the PBMs are catering to them from a service perspective. Um, when you look at the mid-market segment, which probably a lot of you fall into, um, only about one in five are carving out the pharmacy. And again, it's because if you go direct to one of the big PBMs, which are who you want to work with, by the way, because Express Scripts, CVS Caremark, Catamaran Optum, these are massive organizations. They're, they're reinvesting hundreds of millions of dollars back into their clinical programs every year. Um, they've got the deepest discounts with the pharmacies, the best rebates um, with the brand manufacturers. Um, but the problem is they're, they're such big organizations and they're answering to Wall Street. So they're catering to their FedEx accounts and, and their, their jumbo accounts, their health plan arrangements. So the mid market, the, the, 1,000 life group, 500 life group, even 5,000 life group, sort of gets lost in the shuffle from both a, a pricing and a, and a service perspective. Uh, so what we've done at, at, through the C2 arrangement is we went to these PBMs and leveraged the, the size and scope of the combined books of business of the seven firms in the, in the C2 organization. Um, and negotiated contracts that allow the, the mid-market to purchase like a much larger organization. So we're, we're helping the uh, 500, 1,000 life company purchase like uh, a 20,000 life company, for example. And, and we'll show you an example of that in a minute. Um, in addition to that, uh, we're providing an, another layer of, of service on top of um, the, the PBM's traditional model to oversee and to make sure that they're performing to the terms of the contract, uh, to make sure that there are no gaps in, in, um, in service issues and things of that nature. So again, when you carve out the pharmacy, you're, you're in a direct relationship with the PBM, you're in a direct relationship with the experts. Uh, pharmacy is all the PBMs do. In a health plan ar arrangement, uh, pharmacy tends to take a back seat to the medical and you don't get as much laser focused attention, which is really important right now because again, we, we saw the statistics, pharmacy is only increasing uh, and it's only going to get worse. It's, it's becoming a bigger piece of the pie. So it's something that you've really got to pay attention to. When we look at the, the trends in a carved in or health insurer, model versus a carved out or PBM model. Uh, you can see that over the years there's been a, a, an increasingly uh, large gap uh, in the trend. So, you know, we saw end of the year 2013 and end of into 14, the uh, health insurer pharmacy trend was upwards of 10 to 12 percent, whereas in a carved out arrangement we saw 3 to 4 percent trend. Um, those trends are going to be increasing. You will, we probably need to update this slide for, for 2014, but, uh, but you're going to also consent, continue to see that gap increase. <clears throat> so, in conclusion, um, you know, pharmacy again, 
20 to 25 percent of your spend it's only getting bigger uh, but there are ways to, to stay ahead of these trends uh, but it's it's really important to be able to drill down and, and understand your utilization understand your population and uh, the options that you have and the PBMs the pharmacy benefit managers have tons of different levers programs that could be put in place to control costs but you also want to make sure that you're purchasing effectively um, which is what we're going to talk about next in, in this case study. Uh, so Gary's going to actually walk through a, a case study that demonstrates the value of the analytics that, that we together provide for, uh, for TPG clients. Um, and it, it's something that I would encourage you all to participate in. There's, there's no cost to do this. Um, and especially if you're in a carved in arrangement where you don't hold a contract with a PBM, um, this exercise will give you insight into your current arrangement and how you're actually performing today. So it's a check on the incumbent, but it's also a market check because the, the um, report reprices your claims as if you're processed through these coalition type arrangements that we've negotiated so that you can see how your, your deal compares to the marketplplace. So Gary, you want to take the next no, section it. and again we just wanted to hit some of the highlights on what's going on in the landscape there's a lot of moving parts in pharmacy and there's something new every day there's a new drug coming out something is changing there's multiple strategies that you can employ and every group is going to be different so some of these you know the formulary optimization you know when you hear the word exclusion you know for a lot of HR people and you're thinking about impact to members, excluding a drug seems like it's very negative. But as long as there is an alternative out there and you communicate it up front and you understand why we're doing this for the good of the plan and there's other options, then that excluded drug is not that bad. Um, narrow network options, driving, uh, we're seeing more and more uh, driving to mail order. There's, there's huge potential savings, the 90 day, driving some of the adherence. So it's not just what's my co-pays anymore, you know, do I have a bigger spread between my generic and brand and brand to non-preferred brand name? It's really going deeper into that formula. Again, that's one piece. Adherence is another huge piece. And I think involving from a clinical aspect, uh, you know, have we, all the data is there. You know, they know gaps and fill rates. They know what drugs people are taking. But it's can we connect that member to the clinician and make sure that they are adherent and they're doing what they need to do. So there's a ton of different strategies out there. And then the carve in, carve out discussion, that's really at a baseline level, it is lowering your cost basis. Can I get the best discount available? But then once you do that, if Trend keeps doing that, okay, that was a stop gap, but I need to be looking at all these other options as well to help manage. So what we wanted to do to kind of wrap up uh, is walk you through a case study. And this is an actual group, it's about a 400 life group uh, that is self-funded, they've been self-funded for uh, probably eight or nine years. And you know, if I look at the statistics, so about a 400 life group, uh, it is a client here in Portland. And when we looked at their pharmacy and when we sat down and had these initial discussions with the group, it was, <clears throat> excuse me, a situation where they're saying, you know what, I think we're pretty good. We're with a, a large, well-known uh, carrier and why, you know, how could we get a better deal than what they're delivering to us? So, you know, that's one perception. And then the other perception is, well, look at our generic utilization. Uh, this was a couple years ago and it was 85, 86%. So they were going, you know, we got the plan design. You've done a good job of designing, you know, generic brand, non-preferred. We seem to be doing a pretty good job, but you know what? Let's take a look at it. And so what we're going to share with you, it's a great performing group, uh, but there was still substantial savings. Um, other things that, you know, this, th when the HR team and their CFO and even their, their CEO had discussions, because they are worried about retention and recruitment, you know, controlling costs is very, very important, but if you're not able to retain your employees, if you're not able to recruit new employees, having, you know, lower costs doesn't do you a lot of good. So some of the other things that we talked about before we get into the nitty gritty, uh, they were very concerned about member disruption. You know, okay, how is this going to impact my employees? How is it going to impact their families? And really, when we look at it, uh, there is typically a new card that needs to be issued because obviously that there's going to be a new pharmacy benefit manager, and they're going to have, and even in some situations, in this example was actually, it was the same pharmacy benefit manager, but we just got them a better deal. 
there's still a change to their, their routing code, to their number on the card. But that is one thing you can't really avoid. People are going to get issued new cards if you switch contracts. Another thing is there are a lot of times if you're moving, let's say you're with Catamaran right now, and we do the analysis and you say, okay, Express Scripts is going to save us 17%. And that's definitely worth it. That's a huge amount of savings. We're going to make a change. Inevitably, there are going to be minor formulary changes. So, for example, you might have a preferred brand name drug that's with Catamaran. That drug's still going to be covered under Express Scripts. But again, Express Scripts might have it in a non-preferred brand name category. So th there's going to be that minor disruption. A handful of employees are going to see a drug changing from a Tier 2 to a Tier 3. But you're also going to have the winners where they're going to have a drug that's in Tier 2 that now with the new PBM is going to be in Tier 1. And part of the analysis when we get down to the nitty gritty is we look at the impact. How many people and what drugs are moving from Tier 2 to Tier 3 and vice versa. So we do get into that level of discussion so we know, okay, you're going to have 20 people that are going to see their copays go from a preferred brand name drug of $20 to a $40 non-preferred non brand name drug. So they're going to see that. But in this group, uh, we did have about 25 people that had that negative experience. We had over 50 people have a positive experience, though. So you get into that nitty gritty. There are typically some minor exclusions. Uh, this is just the one that we had here was there was one inhaler. Uh, it was a rescue inhaler that about 10 people were using. Under the new PBM, it was an excluded drug. Uh, but again, excluded, there was five or six other options as far as rescue inhalers that were in both the non-preferred and the preferred category. So it wasn't like we were just saying no, it's just you need to, to, to shift. But there are some minor exclusions. And then the other thing that uh, typically we will get from the incumbent PBM that we're moving from is prior authorizations. Because uh, this employer, didn't want their employees to have to jump back through a prior authorization. If they've already been pre-approved to take a drug, then they didn't want to have those members have to go back and, and get, you know, uh, redone for that prior authorization. So we simply get that list and we automatically code that. That's part of the setup. But really when you talk about member disruption, we can quantify that. It, it, it is typically pretty minimal. Uh, the employer impact is extremely minimal. So as Robert talked about, in a self-funded plan, you typically have two bills that you're paying. You have your fixed expenses that you're getting paid once a or you're paying once a month, and then depending on your arrangement with your TBA, TPA, if it's a bundled or carved in plan, you're getting claims on a weekly or every two weeks. You're cutting a check for the claims. What happens when you carve out the pharmacy is you still have those fixed fees that the TPA is charging, but now you're gonna have your medical claims and that's gonna be one check and you're gonna have a separate bill for your pharmacy as well. So that is really kind of the, the big change from an employer or accounting standpoint, but it's really not, not a huge change out there if we're just doing a takeover. Now obviously there's some setup and you wanna make sure implementation is set up correctly, but on an ongoing basis, the impact to the employer is pretty minimal. And you know, Robert, you know, he hit on this a little bit, but you know, if you choose to have an audit done uh, by the partners group and uh, RX benefits, you may get some pushback from the carrier or the TPA or your PBM. And so kind of some of the, the typical responses, and uh, Robert hit on it, for most carriers out there, pharmacy is a profit center. So he talked about that spread, and I'll show you the example of they may negotiate an 80% discount or 75% discount off of AWP, but if they're only passing along 65% of that discount, that 10% spread, that's profit to them. So that is a challenge out there. But again, keep in mind, if you're self-funded, it's your data. Again, you're the one paying the bills. It's your right to look at this. Um, Multi-year contracts. We ran into this with another group. And you know, a lot of times when you're thinking about your, your disability or, God, could I get a two-year rate guarantee on my medical plan? You know, that would be awesome, but no one does that. Uh, but again, the long, longer you can get a rate guarantee, typically that's a better deal. Unfortunately, in the pharmacy world, that's only a good deal for the PBM because typically what happens in a pharmacy is they're continually negotiating lower cost with the pharmacy manufacturers, and any new drug that comes onto the marketplace, it's going to be expensive regardless. And so they're just going to pass those expenses on, but any of those negotiated savings 
over a two or a three year contract, they're just going to pocket because they're just still with the old contract, the stale discounts. They may be improving that discount year over year, but they're not passing that on to you because their contract says, well, I only need to give you a 14% discount off of AWP, but now it's two years later and I've negotiated down to, or I've negotiated a higher discount, it's a 17% discount. So again, another way for them to keep the spread. So we've ran into some clients where, and again, it's just, you know, this is something that is not bad. It just, it happens out there and it is what it is. But, you know, we looked at them and we did the analysis and said, you know, we can save you substantial dollars, but we're going to have to wait one year because the penalty to get out of that contract early was almost, um, you know, it was over $500,000. So they put some huge handcuffs uh, when, you're, when you're getting these three-year deals and it's really not a deal out there. So that's something you need to be aware of. The other thing that we run into um, is an integration fee. And I put that in quotes because it, it kills me. But a lot of TPAs out there, and some are very reasonable, uh, some charge a very high integration fee, but if you do choose to carve out the PBM, they will charge you a per employee per month fee or integration fee because they're now working with an outside vendor versus having it bundled together. There's some TPAs out there that may only charge 45 cents, for example, uh, for an integration fee. There's others that will charge $6 PEPM. So, you know, sometimes you have that balance out there. A reasonable fee is probably going to be somewhere between 2 and $3 on a carve-out basis. But that is, every TPA is going to be different. And I will tell you, again, I put the integration fee in, in quotes there, is because it's really, there's not that much integration. Once they set up the feed, because they need to be able to still get what are the claims dollars coming from that PBM, because it all accumulates to your max out of pocket, setting up that feed isn't that complicated. It's electronic data interface. They're doing it every day. It's really more, okay, I've lost some money. I've lost that profit center, so I need to make up some revenue as well. So those are things that you're going to see out there. Those are going to be the conversations that if you go down this path that we would walk you through that may come up with your PBM or your ASO uh, carrier. But on average, we are seeing typically between 10 and 30% savings. Uh, when we do this audit. And so I want to walk you through, and now I should have passed out reading glasses. I should have ran to Costco last night. So, you know, it, it may be a little bit hard to read, but you also have it in the packet here. And uh, I just want to walk you through high level. So, so this is an executive summary. This is that 400 life group here in Portland that was actually performing very well. Their spend on a um, per claim was very, very low, very, you know, lower than a lot of groups out there. And this was actually a medical clinic and medical clinics tend to be a little bit higher. Uh, but what we did is in this situation, they were with CVS Caremark. So that is that first column on the uh, left-hand side. And what we do is we take 12 months of RX claims data. So we're getting actual claims data. It's not an estimate this, or this is what we think we can do. It's actually getting the claims feed on the RX and saying and running it through the C2 contract to say if we if we would have had our contract in place in this 12 month period of time this would have been your cost so really trying to do a, a true apples to apples and basically what we found with both when we compared their contract which was direct with the TPA to our C2 contract both with Caremart and Express Scripts we actually found uh, just right around 30% savings. Now, for some of you, depending on the size of the group, $163,000, uh, you know, if you're spending 10 million or 15 million, that may not be a lot, but this group was only spending about 5 million a year. And so when you think about, or maybe four and a half actually at the time, 30% savings, $163,000 that they didn't have to pay out of their own pocket was a huge win to them. Of course, we had to go through all the considerations about, you know, member impact, disruption, how are we going to set it all up. But just at a high level, I wanted to share this with you. The other thing that I didn't circle uh, is contract type. And, you know, there is a lot of discussion out there in the marketplace, a traditional contract. And what traditional means is simply, okay, I'm going to get this discount off of average wholesale price for retail brand name drugs. Retail generic, we're getting this discount mail order, we're getting this discount, rebates, you're getting this per script. Uh, that's a traditional contract. There's also what's called transparent contracts out there, and there's some great PBMs. Navitus is a great PBM out there. 
they do a great job, they have a transparent model, and we can actually do transparent models as well uh, through the C2 partner. But regardless of what you call it, really what matters is that bottom line. What is the final savings? What is going to be my cost from an employer perspective that's going to go out the door on an annual basis for pharmacy, and am I getting the lowest cost? So whether it's a tr what they call a transparent model or a traditional model, really I would have you think about what is the bottom line impact to the group. Now here's the reading test, so uh, a, a lot harder to read. But this goes back to what Robert said, and again, I circled a couple of key things and we have highlighted there. So you may have a contract and it may read 16% off AWP for brand name drugs. And again, we talked about how you got to go a little bit deeper to find out are you really getting it. The only way you can do that is by doing the analysis and then we get down to what we call an effective rate. So we don't really care, you know, the contract says one thing, but how do you know you're really getting those discounts? And so we go in, when we reprice it, we look at the actual discounts that you're getting right now, and we call that the effective rate. And again, this is going to be really hard to read, but uh, this is uh, retail brand name, and you have the, the spend. So this group was spending $216,000, and they were getting about a 15% discount. And you compare that to the cost under the CVS, the C2 contract, the discount was a little bit higher. Not a huge number. What's very interesting is what is the effective discount? And this is where we see, this goes back to Robert's comment about the, the spread. What is the discount on generic drugs? We all know that we want people using as many generic drugs as we can. It's the lowest cost option. It goes back to 84% of the scripts or more are being used on a generic basis but there are still huge dollars in that generic spend. And this is where a lot of carriers and PBMs make their money. There's a huge spread. So you can see here that this group was only getting a 55% discount off of AWP, whereas the C2 contract, I think it was 76%. And so that's the true effective rate. Regardless of what the contract says, what are you actually paying? That's what we really get down to. That's what we, we focus on, we boil it down. And again, we do it for retail, what's called Retail 90, which is where someone goes to Rite Aid and they can get a 90-day supply for two copays. So it's kind of like a, a combination mail order. And then the mail order program. The other thing that I did put in red here is the other big piece that we see a lot of times is the rebates. And if you're self-funded, you're probably getting every quarter, depending on the flow, a rebate check. But I would ask, how much are you getting? And you know, that's a big question that's out there. I've seen some contracts where we ran into one where the group wasn't getting any of the rebates, which means that the ASO carrier was keeping 100% of the rebates. Uh, we see, you know, very common is there's a 75 or 80% share of the rebates. But there's still a question of, am I getting all the rebates? There's just, there's so many different things. With the C2 contracts, one of the things that I like is that there is a guaranteed rebate per script. So you'll be able to know if I have 100 retail brand name drugs, I'm going to get this dollar amount per script. So it's guaranteed in the contract. It's something that Robert and his team and we look at. You go back and audit. If we don't get it, we go back to the, the PBM and say, OK, you missed this rebate. Cut us an extra check. So that's something that we look at there. So those are the two big levers, the effective rate broken out by drug, and then also the rebate cost. We do factor in any additional admin fees, but overall this group, uh, like I said, they actually, what they did, because they wanted to minimize the disruption to their members, they moved from their bundled or carved in contract with CVS Caremart, so they basically flipped over to the C2 CVS Caremart contract, secured these discounts. Yes, they had to reissue new cards, but there was no prior auth issues. It was the exact same formulary uh, and they saved 30%, or that's what we were projecting that we were going to save. Um, the other thing that I think it's important when we do this analysis, there's not any um, you know, games behind the scene, scene saying, well, if you put in this, we're assuming you put in these three programs, though, to get to the savings. This is really an apples for apples comparison going, you know, if you don't put in any management programs, this is apples to apples. We'll talk about how to manage additional costs down uh, in the future here in another slide. So the next page, though, 
I, again, we can spreadsheet, we can do the due diligence on what kind of discounts we're getting. We can compare contract language to contract language. That can be done. But then again, how do you audit? How do you know that that 16% discount off a of retail brand name drugs, I actually got? That was my true effective rate. So one of the other things that on a quarterly basis, and this is actually the actual, we just got it and presented it to the group last week, the actual reverse repricing of their 2014 year. Because you know, people come on to the plan, they go off the plan, there's new drugs that are being prescribed, so there are gonna be changes. But we need to hold ourselves accountable, we need to hold RX benefits and the PBM accountable to, you know, are we, we thought we were gonna get a 30% discount based on historical claims data, now let's look at our actual claims data that we incurred under the new contract. Did we see the same results? And really what this is showing is the current actual discount effective rate versus the prior discount rate. So this is a full 12 months. So this was 2014 actual results. And we, you can see you break it down, retail, specialty, mail, dispensing fees, any admin fees, the rebates. And at the end of the day, uh, we projected a little over a 30% savings. We actually found uh, just shy of 32%. So this is something that the group, okay, we made the change, minimal impact to the employer and to the employees, but now did the discounts come through? And the answer is yes. And I think when I think about the, the audit and you know the goal of this audit, if you wanna take advantage of it, and as Robert said, there's not gonna be a fee or a charge for that, it's gonna give you one or two uh, results. Number one, you're gonna see, okay, the PBM that I have right now, I am getting a good deal. And I will tell you, we've run the audit and there are some very good deals out there that come close to matching. You know, if you're talking about a, a three, four, five percent savings, and you know, and again, 10 grand is a lot of money, but you know, 10, 20 grand may not be worth the change, at least you know you're getting a good deal from your current PBM. But I would probably say eight, eight and a half out of 10 times, we are seeing an average savings between 10 and 30%. Uh, probably the lowest one that I ran uh, was on a group, it was only about a 12% savings, but this was 8,000 lives. And so the savings was over a million bucks. Um, and again, they had some high utilization as well and some, some scary drugs out there. So, you know, there's some significant savings. So every group's gonna be different, but that's what this audit will give you. Either you got a good deal, or you know what, I need to probably uh, get someone to sharpen the pencil and to see if I can find a better deal out there, move to the C2 contract, have a dialogue. But this is the reverse repricing, and then this is something that we will continue to do. So this was the, the year one. Now with this group, we're meeting with them quarterly, and that's what we do for all of our self-funded groups to go over all the financials. But this is now a package that's saying, okay, Q1 2015, here was our contracted rates, how is our effective rate? So are they continuing to hold true to the contract? Uh, so that's, again, uh, the, the management of the program. You know, the last thing, and again, very hard to read, but I wanted just to have this dialogue because, as, again, as I said, the contract, let's say we can save you 15% on your pharmacy spend. That's lowering your cost basis. But again, as Robert said, RX Trend is still doing this. So what do we do in the future? With this group, these are the conversations we're having right now to say, okay, we took it over. We saved you 30%, that's great. But again, you've got more lives that are coming onto the plan, pharmacy drugs are doing this. Let's start having a conversation about how can we manage your pharmacy spend in the future? Because yes, we're getting great discounts, but is there other programs that are appropriate based on your people, your culture, your appetite, uh, to put a few more controls in there? Uh, one that we're looking at is actually putting in a mandatory mail order or a maintenance choice program into the plan. And for this group, it could save them another 5% on their spend, another 30 grand. Again, that may not sound like huge numbers, but every dollar counts. I mean, to this group, that's another FTE that they can basically hire. I mean, so that's how they're looking at some of these programs. It's not just keeping our healthcare down, it's allowing us to do, you know, reallocate those dollars more strategically. So there's a lot of different moving parts, and that's what I wanted to share with you. There is strategies out there around formulary, adherence, the, the carving out, getting that lower cost basis, but then as you mature and as you start to see the data, as we start to scrub it, uh, because we on self-funded plans get both uh, the member detail, and again, it's all HIPAA protected and from a privacy standpoint, secure, 
but we're getting medical claims and pharmacy claims, and we're getting that down to the member level. And that's something that we work with our analytics department on and RX benefits, and it goes back to, you know, okay, let's identify some of those claims that are being incurred in the medical office. Does it make sense to say they have to be only paid via the pharmacy benefit? And again, oncology, we're not going to do that for everything, but there's other programs where that makes a ton of sense. So those are the conversations that we have on an ongoing basis to help try and manage the cost of the plans. Because again, Rx is going to become a bigger and bigger piece of the puzzle. So just to wrap things up, um, again, we could have talked for, for many more hours, but I really appreciate your time today. It, it is complex. Healthcare, medical is complex. Pharmacy is a whole nother level. And you know, if you think about the marketplace right now, people are just starting to, to get their hands around, okay, how are physicians paid? How are hospitals paid? You know, what kind of discounts are we doing? You know, what kind of results are we getting? So it's starting to move down that path, but pharmacy is kind of that neglected piece because they're just assuming, well, I'm with United Healthcare and I'm getting the best pharmacy that I can because it's United Healthcare. And again, United Healthcare is a great carrier, but that may not always be the case. So again, you need to get into the details. On average, it's 20 to 25 percent of your total spend, and that, as Robert said, it's going up. So this is something that you definitely need to be paying attention to. And then, you know, really, the pharmacy landscape is continuing to change. How many specialty drugs are in the pipeline right now, Robert? Do you got a rough? 50 in 2015. So, so 50 specialty meds are coming out in 2015. And even if it's a lower-end drug, many of you have probably seen, like, Embril for MS, and that, that's what uh, Phil Mickelson advertises all the time. Um, it's 22 grand, there's 2,500 bucks a month for Embril. And there's 50 of those drugs out there, and that 2,500, that's on the low end of cost for some of these uh, specialty medications. So the landscape is continuing to change. It's not just lowering your cost bases up front. What are you doing to manage on an ongoing basis? And that's part of the conversation right there. And ultimately, we wanna make sure we're managing it so you and your people don't feel like that. So uh, doing a little begging at the, the pharmacy counter. Uh, so with that, um, we are wrapped up. I, hopefully, I think we're still doing okay for time. Um, so a couple requests that I have for you. We do have on the counter, on the table, feedback form. So love to hear uh, if there's future topics uh, that you'd be interested in hearing about. We do have, in June, we have another uh, online enrollment exchange discussion that's coming up. And then in September, we're scheduled for a healthcare reform update. Uh, so, you know, again, healthcare reform is not going away, so that's going to continue. But if there's other topics you'd be interested in hearing about, we'd love to hear, hear from you. We can definitely get that programming in. Um, I believe in the middle of the page, there is, if you're interested in doing that PBM audit, again, we're going to do that at no charge. Uh, we just need to get the data. But if you're interested in that, please complete that form, and we'd be more than happy to do that. Well, with that, again, I really appreciate your time. I know the, you know some people drove a long way, so I appreciate it. Was the farthest battleground? Is that what I heard there? Did we have someone coming from? You know, so we had a, we had a few trips there. So, um, and I know traffic was a little bit uh, of a challenge. Uh, but again, I appreciate all your time. I'll stick around. Robert and I will be here if you have any questions afterwards. But uh, again, appreciate you taking the time. And um, let us know if we can be of any help and service. Thank you very much. Uh,